Hello, and welcome back to Fandom Fridays, where we proceed to check out all the fanfics that are not party related. Why? Well, duh. Because it's fun. I don't want to make sure that all your fandoms get absolutely represented out there. After all, too many people go for the bad stuff that they tend to forget all the cool stuff. Uh, I think it's easy, people. Do the news job. It, it's not. I work diligently every week to find a new fanfic for you guys to do. I work my darnness. I do everything I can to show off what type of fanfics are out there. Just believe him, everyone. He just sits around all day and does nothing. It then has a last minute crunch time every day he gets. Shut up, Trixie. You know, I realize I haven't done any Full Metal Alchemist in over a year. I think it's about time we changed that. Now look, there's one with Full Metal and Ruby. So stay here as I, we here at the Tree Berry Memorial Library and proud to present a new set of rules. By Korzark. Enjoy. A new set of rules. By Korsark. Chapter 1. The air was charged with a strange energy. Many events led to this climax, but even after the final blow was dealt, Feli the creature claimed to have harnessed God's powers for itself, confronting emotions ran rampant. Nobody knew whether to cheer or cry. The young man stood in the center of the clearing could barely register what had just happened. On one hand, the threat was gone. Humanity was saved, but many lives were taken for the cost of victory. The young man morbidly noted that this small war seemed to follow the laws of equivalent exchange, just like the alchemy that had been used to end it. He looked down at his feet to see a broken suit of armor that once hosed the soul of his little brother. Alphonse had exchanged his soul so Edward could get his arm back once again. Edward was now in a frantic state of mind, thinking of all the possible ways to try and bring his brother back. He promised Alphonse he would never use a human soul to restore either of their bodies, so the only option was to use something else. But there was nothing in the world that could be equivalent to a human life. Edward racked his brains to try to think of something that he could use. With a spark of inspiration, he realized something that the world might consider even greater than a single human soul. May back up, he said to the tear-stained girl who lay haunched over her brother, his brother's body. Picking a stick off the ground, he started to carefully draw a pattern in the dirt. He cringed a bit at the pattern on the ground, but continued with determination. Hopefully, this would be the last human transmutation circle he would ever see. Despite the shock of his friend's faces, he stood in the center of the circle and clapped his hands together. I'll be right back, he said. He had hoped that his expression was much more confident than he felt. Here comes the full metal alchemist's final transmutation! He slammed his hands against the ground. He felt a similarly familiar feeling being deconstructed. He felt his body disappearing from the world, his consciousness slipping away with it. When he opened his eyes, he saw nothing but a white silhouette of himself, casually sitting in front of the large door. Come for your brother, eh? The thing, truth as it's called itself, never seemed to talk. Edward only felt its words resonate inside him. How do you plan on extracting a human being? How will you pay? Will you offer me your entire being? Edward ignored his success and walked past it as casually as he could. As he walked up to the door, it seemed to hold all the secrets in the world. He felt his confidence gradually increase. The only thing that would be equal to a soul would be the laws of the world itself. All is one, one is all, he thought to himself. I got your payment right here, Edward said, not even bothering to confirm his suspicions. <laughs> it's really big, though. A moment of silence passed through everything happened. The gate of truth lies within every human being. Thus, it is also the potential of those human beings to use alchemy. Edward heard the words echo through his own mind. The words were mostly emotionless, but he thought he could sense a bit of surprise in them. Will you sacrifice the power to use alchemy? Simply become an ordinary human being? I've always been an ordinary human. Just a little man who couldn't save one poor girl they turned to a chimera. Someone who caught a close to truth and started over-relying on its gift, only to fail again and again. 
It's all been one long dance. I used all right with losing this. Edward turned to catch a glimpse of Truth's face on his face. I don't need alchemy as long as I have my friends. Guess Truth gave a wide grin. Edward turned back around to face the gate, mentally prepared himself to pay the largest toll alchemy had to offer. But Truth's next words shocked him. I sincerely hope that's the right answer, alchemist, he heard. It took a second to register what he just said. He turned around to see Truth giving a wide grin and an uncharacteristic shrug. What? What do you mean by that? Edward asked uncertainly. He never imagined that being known as Truth wouldn't know the truth of something. But here it was. Truth only shook its head. You of all people should know that there isn't only one truth, it told him, pointing up towards the sky. Edward followed to the race he was pointing at, and his eyes widened in shock. It was another gate. I am just one of many. You just live in a world that follows my word. A few seconds passed before Edward regained his senses. Seeking his head, he steeled his mind to face truth. Truth is a troll. What does that mean for me? It means I don't know how to chance you myself. You were the only human to ever try. So that's it? This is the end? Edward asked, clasping his fist together until his knuckles turned right. No, he replied, giving Edward a spark of hope. Probably. <laughs> I don't know how to transmute myself, but that doesn't mean nobody knows how. It says, pointing to the sky once again, Go to another world and learn how their truth works. Maybe they'll have an idea how to train me off for your little brother. Simple, right? Looking between truth and the gate it was pointing to, Edward grimaced but nodded his head. Of course, he said grimly. I'll be back before you know it. The door above him opened up, and Edward saw darkness within. But it was unfamiliar to him. Somehow it seemed to be different from the door of truth he was so used to, but that wasn't going to stop him. As a group of shadowy tendrils extended towards to claim him, he turned to his world's truth. Got any words for me? Truth never dropped his smile. The other world follows its own set of rules. You'll be a foreign object, so be careful about what may happen there. Will you be eliminated by the world itself? Will you still subscribe to your world's truth? Will your body assimilate to the laws of the new world? Who knows? It's been a while since I've been so clueless. It shook his head, though I'm still grinning. What are the kids? Have fun. Hopefully you'll see me again soon. Edward nodded as he felt the new gate of truth pull himself toward. Also, don't worry about time. There are two completely different worlds. Just focus learning on all you can. After all, I'm pretty curious about how this new world works, too. Then everything seemed to explode. Whenever he entered a gate, it was much more often than he liked. He felt as if the entire of his body was systematically being deconstructed. It was a painful and unnerving process whenever he felt his body simply leaving him. This gate was different and didn't have to be deconstructed. Instead, he felt his body being overloaded with a large amount of energy. At least with his gate, he couldn't feel the pain in the arm he didn't have. With this gate, he had no solace. But it was over in an instant. He opened his eyes to find he was laying down on his back. The ground was surprisingly soft, and he could feel a light breeze tickling his face. His vision was blurry, but he could see a lot of red around him, illuminated by the soft light above. After moving around a bit, he confirmed he was still completely there, though he wasn't all too used to having both his arms being made of less. Moving around, he heard a soft crunching sound, and after picking up a small object on the ground, holding it close to his face, he confirmed it was a bright red leaf. Ugh, oh, nothing too strange yet commented to no one in particular as he got up slowly. He leaned on a tree before rubbing his eyes. His visit was still slightly blurry, and it was getting better now. I was pleased to learn that it was only temporary. A moment passed before Edward could get his bearings. He straightened himself up. Well, I guess no time like the present. He said as he patted down his clothes, or at least what was left of them after the intense battle with Democulus. All this world has people in it other than me, he mumbled to himself. So he gave out a big sigh. He was decided to be grateful that he was alive in the first place. Then he had the opportunity to finally revive his little brother's body. Even though it involved traveling so far into the unknown. He was grateful that Gain hadn't decided to kill him. And he was grateful that he wasn't killed as soon as he fell into this new world. As people and empty the forest seemed, he had no way of knowing how much danger it held. Fortunately, him being alive meant he was probably not in any immediate danger. 
It was also nice at how he could actually see, despite it being nighttime. He had the bright moon to thank for that. Despite the fact that he literally punched the god to the death minutes before, he was surprised to find his eyes widening after looking up to acknowledge the current source of the light. Well, guess that sells it. I'm not in a mystery anymore. The broken moon continued to shine its light down. And I'm still playing some Ruby music in my head. Chapter 2 Osborne was facing a dilemma. Just a few minutes before, Osborne gave a small sigh of relief as he sipped the last bit of his coffee from his mug. He fell as the last few moments when he could finish a good cup of coffee, experiencing the effects of a tranquil energy in the privacy of his own office. It had taken him a small moment before he returned to full consciousness as he stretched his limbs to bask in a post-coffee glow and congratulated himself for finishing half of his piled-up paperwork before nightfall. He looked out towards the setting sun and immediately regretted the decision. The broken moon gave him a painful warning that the day had ended long ago, and Osprey thus drank the equivalent of five cups of strong coffee. Now Osprey was seriously considering the benefits of knocking himself out, so he could get afraid for a few hours of sleep for a bruise. He weighed the pros and cons, but there was also the problem of liking a clean method to knock himself out. He knew it wouldn't hurt too badly because of his aura, but it would also be very difficult to do because of his aura. He sighed, knowing that he had to sleep to be functional the next day. Coffee could only keep him going for so long. He learned it the hard way in his first year of teaching. He sat back on his desk and connected to the CCT, quickly searching up methods to make a contraption that could knock him out. He consulted the instructions of a devilist's called, a company called Acme. Oh, boo, boo, that joke was horrible, get off the stage. But due to the need for anvils he didn't have on hand, he sighed and disconnected. Distracted from his original purpose, he switched his surveillance camera's feeds to the grim infested areas and beacons to restriction. Despite the dangers, no one could deny they were beautiful. Osborne agreed completely and would often find himself lost in the sights. Forever Fall was a nice change of pace. After overanalyzing the place for any unpredictable elements to serve for the utmost safety of the first year's initiation test, Hello Forest had temporarily lost its flair. In contrast to the less green landscape, Forever Fall had a familiar feeling to it. The forest's welcome moon provided more than enough light for Osmond to admire the bright red and golden colors that flashed throughout the night. Osmond frowned, catching his last thought. Gold? He started switching through the cameras, trying to find the object that didn't belong. Gold was not a color that belonged to Forever Fall. It was possible that he saw the white of a grim mask, but he was almost certain that it wasn't the case. His face paled when he saw the anomaly. Blonde hair. A young boy he didn't recognize was wandering through the forest, covered in wounds blood. Black. He wasted no time slamming the button that infiltrated the intercom to the green hair professor's room. Get to Forever Fall now. I don't care how you do it. A young civilian is alone and injured. He said, hoping that Oblake was still awake for the copious amounts of coffee he could have continuously drank. I'll be right on it! What? You used your caboose voice. <laughs> what? It is! Osprey opened his scroll and sent Oblake to coordinates of the boy's location. Osmond wanted to face around the office, but his friendly's feet kept him too occupied. Switching from camera to camera, he made quick noise of the boy's immediate surroundings. When he saw the white, red, and black of a nearby Grim, his heart sank. Hey, wait. The Grim has red, black, and white, and Ed has yellow. Finally! Ruby colors! I'm sorry. It was a small Ursa. A creature that most of his students could kill without breaking a sweat, but to a regular civilian, the meaning of one of these creatures would only be followed up with certain death. Thankfully, the Ursa hadn't noticed the boy yet, but Osmond knew that was sure to change. He had no doubt that the boy's negative emotions were essentially acting as a lighthouse for the Grim after being injured and lost. He gripped his cane and berated himself for allowing the security around the borders of Forever Fall to be so lax that civilian could wander in. He scolded himself for being so cocky about the fact that nothing like this had ever happened under his watch before. Shaking his head, he stopped thinking about his failures and started to th focus on what he could do now. Ublake was fulfilling his own job as the emergency response press professor, but 
It was possible he wouldn't get there in time before the Ursa inevitably knows the boy and torn him to pieces. He had a few cameras around the forest that were capable of turning into our remotely controlled drones. He could he activate a few of them and lead the Ursa away? He shook his head, rejecting the idea. The drones were not made for combat, and the Ursa could easily catch up to them and destroy them. Crossing machines would be loud, and perhaps draw more Grimm to the area. He considered using the drones to lead the boy away from the Grimm instead, but he hesitated. If the boy was easily scared, he might yell out after seeing the drone and bring the Grimm directly towards him. Austin wasn't ready to take such a gamble that might shorten his life. Austin's thoughts were interrupted as he noticed the movement. The Ursa's nose was up in the air, sniffing for the strange scent that had just picked up. Austin paled, realizing that the Ursa was only moments away from finding the boy and attacking. He had no more time to think. With the press of a few buttons, he activated all the drones in the surrounding area. He led a few of them to intercept the Ursa's path to the boy, but mostly ignored them and barreled through without a care sending the rest to the go to the boy's location. Most nervously as the Ursa drew closer. When the Ursa burst through the trees into the small clearing of where the boy was, it only took a moment to roar at the boy at first. Osman, thankful of the intimidation tech that made the Grim seem to enjoy, urged his drones closer. When the Ursa finally started to lumber forward, Osman activated the semblance. Oh, did you know love it when fanfic writers make up a semblance for a character? Sometimes it could just be silly. He started to feel uncomfortable, the familiar feeling of time slowing down around him. He wants none of the extra time as he analyzed the situation more closely. Commanding on one drone on a collision course towards the Ursa's eye, once the boy reacted with a look of surprise. Ursa didn't notice the drone until it crashed into it, taking a swipe into it. Osman noticed the slow trajectory and tried to calculate a path for the drone so he could crash into its side, determining that the drone wouldn't be fast enough to avoid the wide claws. He sent it as far back as possible, and sent two other drones to cast into the Ursa's back. Also, the Ursa slowly reached for the reaching drone, catching it and easily destroying it, and receiving only an annoying sting in the back as a response. Osman watched the Ursa's movement, and knowing in terror that the Ursa was not moving to swat the two new drones behind him, Sight ignored him and slowly ran at the boy in a mass status instead. Osman instantly sent the rest of his observational drones towards the path of the beast, but he knew they would never cause any damage. The Ursa could easily ignore them and claim its prize. Osman slumped in the chair, destroying his only ability to do anything to help. He watched as the Ursa lunged at the boy and fell into a slow descent. Osman didn't bother to turn off his semblance. He feels his aura being drained and his body burning. He decided that he needed to burn the memory into his mind. See, many deaths, many of which were caused by his own confidence. Though this was just one of many. It had been a few years since he'd seen the death of a young civilian. He was determined to give the boy the respect he deserved, but watching his death until the end. He clapped his hands together, closed his eyes, and prayed. He didn't believe in any sort of god, but he did it anyways. He prayed whatever god the boy was praying to was watching over him. Opening his eyes after this brief moment of antagonism, he looked up to notice the boy was no longer praying. Perhaps he lost his faith after facing the harsh reality of death. While silently as the boy tried to duck his head down, toss the claws headed towards him. As we noticed sadly, to stress the two objects, the boy would still be hit. Then the boy's hands hit the ground, and everything changed! Osman's eyes widened as the flash of electricity seemed to emanate from the boy's hands and into the ground. The end of his semblance, Osman watched as the two giant slabs of stone seemed to fold upwards and slam into the Ursa, trapping and incapacitating the Ursa. What was that? He asked himself. No longer worried about the boy's safety. Was that magic? It's not magic. It's alchemy! I still want to get Fig to see that line in Ed's voice. The manipulation of the elements was not a strange concept to most people. But that was only when dust was involved. Without it, such a task was impossible. Unless, of course, you had magic on your side. In other words, if you were one of the four maidens. Or a silver-eyed warrior. Without thinking, he sent one of the officer hazel drones closer. At this distance, you can see the boy wasn't physically carrying any dust on his person. Though, he wanted to expect the boy more. There was a sudden jolt in the video feed. After being, uh, grabbing the strange object, the boy brought it curiously closer so he could inspect it. Giving Osman a clear look at his face. He noticed that unlike the initial diagnosis of the boy being weak and scared, 
The boy's determined and confident expression surprised him. Not his breath for what felt like the, the first time that night. Grabbing the scroll, he picked up Ublak's contact information. Ublak, is that you? He asked once he heard the ringing on the other end. The phone stopped. Yes, yes, I'm on my way. I'm fine. It's me. I'm currently only a few meters or hundreds away from the coordinates you gave me. Fall back, Ublak. You can go back to sleep. Osmond says he reached over the coffee machine. A moment of unusual silence came from the hyperactive professor. Is something wrong, Ublak? Osmond asked, almost certain that the only times he had Ublak so silent were when he was asleep. It's nothing, sir, he heard. Are you sure you don't want me to go down there? There might not be much of a body left, but I'm certain the civilian's family would appreciate having a proper funeral. Osmond fumbled with his mug, as he realized his words must have sound like. Well, no, 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 no. I didn't mean that the boy died out there. Osmond corrected. It's actually one of our transfer students who didn't make it to the initiation. He's somewhat of a special student, so I gave him an exception for being late. But I still felt the need to give him some sort of test. It seems that I have just forgotten about this and called you in a panic. Osmond heard a sigh of relief coming from the other end of the scroll. Okay then, sir, thank you for letting me know. It would have certainly been much better if you hadn't forgotten about that small detail you had called for me. But I realize the first few days of the year are always the most stressful for you, and as soon as he's to have an unusual special case for him to be in such a way, but I still have faith in your decisions, then... That's enough, Ublak. Osmond interrupted before the man decided to tell an impromptu history lesson. You may return to your quarters. I'll have Glenda return to the student once he finishes with his trials. Yes, yes, of course! Osmond immediately closed the call and searched up Glenda's contact information. Glenda, I need you to get to Forever Fall immediately. There's a young boy out there on his own. Shouldn't you be calling a play for this? Gidlin does reply, as slight tense professionalism and concern, though it could not fully mask her sleepiness. I don't think I can reach forever fall as fast as he could. It's not the boy that's the problem, Glinda. He said, it's what he can do. I think he was using magic. A moment of silence passed before he heard a response. Are you sure? If it's a young boy, he shouldn't be able to possess the power of a maiden. I don't think this is related to the maidens at all. It's magic, but it's something new. I'll be there as soon as possible. The connection cut out, and Osmond quickly sent the coordinates to Glenda's scroll. Edward looked down at the little metal contraption in his head. It was a strange object, one he'd obviously never seen before, a figure he should have expected at what was literally a new world. But the metal bird was something that existed in this world. They eventually had to accept it. He let the bird go and watched it revolve around him. Ignoring the bird, he turned his attention to the thing that he just trapped. He couldn't get a good look at it as he was being attacked. But he figured it'd be easy to do once it was captured. Peering through the cries of the makeshift walls he had created, he was surprised to see what was essentially a grotesque bear. Huh, so it looks like you, there are bears here too. He commented. Despite the strange tattoo like markings and the white bony face mask, it was still bear like in its form. Ugh, at least you're not made out of metal too. The bear only growled in response. Well, Mr. Bear, looks like you're an unlucky guy. Someone sent me here to figure out how this place works, and I just didn't know where to start. He says he can't see transfer his beer out of a nearby rock. <laughs> looks like you're my first volunteer test subject. No way for a reply. He walked up to the bear with an evil grin, watching his frantic movements. He felt kind of sorry for it, but reminded himself that he was sent to this world to complete a task. Also, this thing attacked him first. With a spear, Edward stabbed at the bear's neck in hopes of killing it in the most humane way possible. Surprisingly enough, the spear pierced through the bear's neck quite easily, dropping its head directly at Edward's feet. With a yell, he jumped back, expecting to be fit with his spray with warm blood, but none was spilt. Curious, Edward walked up to pick up its head, but as he moved back forward, he let another yelp as his head started to dissolve away in his hands, along with the trap by. Oh! I wonder if that's normal around here. There's only something else to test that on. For a second, he looked at the metal bird as he continued hovering around him. He quickly took the suggestion out of his mind. The birds were obviously friendly, considering they tried to help him defeat the bear. Now that he thought about it, some of them were already destroyed when they tried to defend him. Looking around the area where the bear came from, he saw the remains of some of the birds lying on the ground. At a bowing his hand bet, he knelt down the allies' remains. He sighed to discover what he found. He didn't travel with Missiri too often, but after being friends with Wendry his whole life, he at least knew what it looked like. The 
Why are some playing total debt? This was man-made. At this point, all these unexpected findings were going to give him a headache. It was an entirely different world, sure. But was it necessarily to be that different? He reached out and grabbed the strange contention. Bring a closer to expression. He saw unless he didn't notice before. Hey! Is anyone watching? He asked. I'm sorry about whether to evoke control contraptions were more likely than the existence of tiny pilots. He hoped it wasn't a liar, else he just witnessed a few deaths. Want to let me know how to get to a safer place? The contestant didn't say anything in response. Instead, Golden Rev was soft red light. Looking up, Ed noticed that a few more lights appeared in the forest, seemingly even down Seth's path. Hopefully these guys are nice, he said as he let go of the metal contraption and followed the lights. He walked along at a medium pace, not questioning the strange direction the lights seemed to go in towards. Whenever there was a strange turn or an inconvenient path, he assumed that whoever was controlling these lights was simply trying to lead him away from the attention of these creatures he had defeated. Eventually, he came to a center of a white clearing. He, after he caught up with the last glowing light, he saw no other lights had appeared. He sat down and groaned. After going on that threat, the relative calm seemed to start to get quite the adrenaline he had accumulated in his body after the hours of fighting what he had recently been through. The fleet had mostly stopped and a gentle wind felt nice on his open wounds. But he still craved the comfort of a soft bed. Whoever was controlling these strange contraptions, he sincerely hoped they had comfortable living spaces. If they were fancy that Nazi was any indication, he trusted he would. Looking over his overly companion, who had accompanied him throughout his walk, he took the time to expect it further. In a sense, he noticed the machinery was not unlike his own arm mail. He looked it over his right arm to compare, but it was a bit of a reminder that he had his regular arm back. He was a bit surprised to find out that he almost missed his arm mail arm. Especially after remembering that his brother had essentially traded his own soul to bring his old one back. He clenched his fists, but it was still a disbelief it was there. Vowing to beat down the truth of this world, drag Alphonse's body and soul back from his own truth, and kick him for being so stupid. Noticing the move in his coroner's eye, noticed that the machine had started glowing again. This time with a bright green light, it was now flying upwards towards the sky. Shrugging, he got up, clapped his hands in the air, and slid on the ground in a practice fashion. He felt the ground rise up from beneath his feet as he followed the machine. After a short while, the machine stopped ascending and flowed to one spot. Green light now blinking off and on. Edward set down his perch, wondering what was going to happen. Peering at the distance, all he could see was a horizon. But he noticed he could hear something. He focused on the sound, but all he could hear was a strange war. Conscious of what the source could be, he straightened his eyes towards the direction that the green light was being flashed towards. Seconds later, he found it. Crap, 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 crap! He says he slammed his hands down on the pillar he was standing on, quickly deconstructing his creation, allowing it to fall gently back on the ground. He didn't know what that thing was, but it wasn't fr friendly. It could easily kill him. The black beast floated towards him at breakneck speed, easily beating the size and imitation factor of a tank. It would panic and slammed his hands to the ground once again, creating a gigantic fist that shot out of the ground towards the creature. Once he took a second to think about what he was doing, his face flushed as he realized it might be the thing that the contention was signaling for. It was friendly that he just made an unnecessary enemy out of something he could easily kill him by walking in a general direction. Surprisingly enough, the beast opened its mouth in response to an attack, or feeling a frail looking blonde woman. Edward opened his mouth to warn the first human he had seen since arrival. Before he could, the woman casually waved a riding crop in the air with no hint of worry on her face. An instant later, the earthen fist seemed to shatter a glow with a purple aura. It gently fell down to the ground. Edward stared up, forgetting his initial fear and awe of the power the woman displayed. It was nothing he had seen it ever before. Magic? He whispered to himself. Was this what the truth wanted him to find? It almost seemed too easy. Bringing one of the earth and stars toward her with Tonkinesis. She rode the other around, inspected for any sign of being infused with dust or aura. She wouldn't call it herself an expert in such matters. To her knowledge, the earthen fist that flew toward her were genuine material. It was magic. It certainly changed things. So let down the boy who stared up to her, wide-eyed open mouth. Seasonally, she closed her legs a little tighter and adjusted her skirt. She wondered what Osmond would choose to do with him. Well, I think we'll stop here for him tonight. This was a rather interesting way to start a story. I've always been curious as to see what other people would do with a with an alternate ending story, especially to a good manga like Full Metal Alchemist. 
and it's definitely great to come back to something as classic as Full Metal and see what the world's like. And this is an exception, especially when it's combining some of my favorite things like Full, full Metal and Ruby. Everybody's in character so far, and I do like the fact that they decided to touch upon Osmond's se semblance. So in all, a fun little short little fic, fic, and I can't wait to see what else the story has brought me. That was one down, that's just more to go. I'll see you next time.